So very fortunate tonight to have Raymond Francis here. Uh, Raymond is a friend and my mentor. Uh, we've probably known each other about 20 years now, so um, I'm excited to have him here. He's living in Florida now, so I don't see him as much as I used to. But uh, Raymond's been called a brilliant advanced thinker and has been cited as one of the few scientists who's achieved a breakthrough understanding of health and disease. I personally think it's the most comprehensive health model uh, that expresses health in the simplest way and makes it actionable too. On the cutting edge of health science, Raymond is an internationally recognized leader in the field of optimal health maintenance and a pioneer in transforming our failed disease care system to a true healthcare system. He's a chemist by training, a graduate of MIT, a best-selling author, and a world-class speaker. Please welcome Raymond Francis. Hello, everybody. Um, can somebody please, uh, I have these little flyers. Can somebody please hand them out? <clears throat> They're on that chair. Um, and I'll give you a slight warning. Um, last night, uh, when I was speaking, somebody uh, spilled a glass of apple cider on, on my <laughs> handouts. Um, so they're a little bit damaged by the apple cider. Um, that's the bad news. Uh, the good news is that if you chew on it, you get a delightful cinnamon flavor. <laughs> so there's always a silver lining to the dark cloud. and. Uh, I thought I'd be embarrassed handing out my damaged flyers, but um, they are tasty. <laughs> so, and I also brought copies of uh, my latest book, The Great American Health Hoax, and, um, and I have uh, a limited number of copies. They'll be available afterwards. Um, they are $15 each. And let me tell you something, uh, these make great gifts. And the holidays are coming up, um, get one for everybody on your Christmas list because you will be giving them the most precious gift of all, the gift of health. Um, topic of my talk tonight is what I want to get across <clears throat> is we have a problem. We have a very, very big problem. That problem is called the epidemic of chronic disease. Chronic disease is epidemic in America, and it is decreasing our quality of life. It is decreasing our longevity, and it is increasing the national debt and threatening to bankrupt the United States government. The government is on an unsustainable path. Uh, within 15 years, unless we do something, we're going under financially. And the US will become like a third world country, unable to pay its financial obligations. If we look at the numbers, the big 800 pound gorilla in the room is the cost of disease. The economists say if we can cut the cost of disease in half, we can salvage the situation and make it manageable. So that needs to be our goal, to at least cut the cost of disease in half. And that, my friends, is easy to, well, I shouldn't say easy, simple, simple to do, not necessarily easy because of all the political impediments and other impediments to implementing it. But if we want to do this, uh, not only for yourself, because if you're healthy, you will feel better, uh, not only for your family, because they'll have you around longer to enjoy you, uh, and not only for America, so that we don't go bankrupt, and, and, uh, <laughs> and that's going to be very unpleasant for everybody. The, the quality of life for everyone will decrease if that happens. So there are great incentives to 
reduce the epidemic of chronic disease and uh, reduce our health care costs. <clears throat> so we have to get on with it. And it has to start with you. It's not going to come from the top down. It has to be a bottom-up revolution with individual people deciding that they are going to be healthy and doing that. And that is a challenge because, you know, most people don't really think about health actively. I mean, people are concerned about their health. There's no question about that. But they're not actively concerned about their health. Uh, they're not reading books on health. They're not trying to educate themselves. They're not looking at everything that they eat and everything that they do in their life and, and trying to be as healthy as they can be. Most people just live their life and, uh, and don't think much about health. So that's a huge impediment to solving our problems. And so it's something that you need to be apostles of and talk to your friends, your family, your neighbors, and start to get them interested in improving their health, as well as you improving yours. And you can be a shining example as you become healthier and healthier and healthier uh, and more energized. Uh, you can be a shining example to all of those around you. Uh, so they'll say, hey, what are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm trying to be healthy. <laughs> so. Health is not an active concern for most people. It's a huge impediment to achieving our goals. So we need to change that. The change needs to start with you. And uh, you need to start taking personal responsibility. We don't teach this. We don't teach people, we don't teach our young people that they are personally responsible for their health. There is no one who is responsible for your health except you. I'm not. Your doctor isn't. Nobody is. You are responsible for your health. No one else. And however, even if you decide to accept this responsibility, you don't know how to do it. Because one, nobody ever told us we were responsible. And two, nobody ever told us how to be responsible, what to do about it. So there's, it's a two-step process. You have to decide, well, I'm going to be responsible for my health, I'm going to educate myself, and I'm going to learn how to get well, how to stay well, how to never be sick again. All of these chronic diseases, and I want to use this word very carefully, there is no compelling reason why anyone should have any of these chronic diseases. And I'll say that again for emphasis. There is no compelling reason why any of us should have any of these chronic diseases. Now, are there genetic diseases uh, that are difficult to deal with? Absolutely, yes. They are true genetic diseases, but you know, you're talking maybe 5% of all disease. The other 95% you're responsible for. And if you learn to accept this responsibility, learn how to execute this responsibility, you can remove disease from your life and you can live a very long disease-free life. Now, I used to be like an ordinary person. Uh, I lived an ordinary life. In fact, I, I, I probably ate a better diet than most people, and I probably um, avoided toxins. And I probably did better than most people. And yet, at age 46, I was crashing. Um, I was tired, fatigued, dragging my tail. I went to my doctor and told my doctor, boy, I'm just, I'm really tired. I just don't have any energy. And the doctor did thousands and thousands of dollars worth of testing. And I came back for the next meeting and the doctor said, you're in perfect health. I said, doc, if I'm in perfect health, how come I feel this way? And he said, you're getting older. And I said, 
I've never felt this way before. And he said, you've never been this old before. The ignorance is so profound that uh, it's just astounding. This man, you know, I always go, I'm a, I'm a quality freak. I want the best of everything. Um, this man was a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. That's pretty prestigious. Professor of medicine, Harvard Medical School, and he was so ignorant, he didn't know that if you're tired, you're really, really, really sick. He just says you're getting older instead of, hey, you're really, really sick, let's try and make you well. Let's try and find out why you're sick. Let's try and make you well. So two more years passed, and, uh, and by that time, my tail was really, really dragging, and I uh, made another mistake, went to see another doctor. Uh, that doctor gave me a diagnostic test to which I suffered a catastrophic reaction, uh, became totally disabled, um, went to uh, 36 top specialists, um, and finally the last one I went to. You know, all these people, they, they, uh, they, they look at you, they measure your symptoms, they come back and they give you a fancy name. Um, you tell them in English what you're experiencing, and they come back with a Latin, um, which is the same thing you just told them in English, and, and for that they send you a bill. Um, so I went to these 36 top specialists, and all they did was send a bill and come up with fancy Latin names for what I told them in English. Um, and the last one finally said, who boy, I can help you take this drug. And I took the drug. The drug poisoned my liver. My liver died. And my death was a medical certainty. At the last moment, I had to use my knowledge of biochemistry to save my life. And then it took me two years of hard work and learning to restore myself to where I could once again function like a normal human being. And after that, I started asking very fundamental questions like, why did I get sick? Why do people get sick? How do people get sick? How do you take a healthy person and make them a sick person? If they have a sick person, how do you make them a healthy person? I started to get answers to these questions, and the answers were so profound, they just blew me away blew me away. Um, and about six months into this, I realized that what we call modern medicine is essentially unscientific nonsense and worthless. It doesn't work, it's very expensive, it's very dangerous, and it's already on the way out. Um, and the faster it goes, the better off we're all gonna be, because it's basically nonsense. So anyway, um, I started thinking about, well, if medicine doesn't work, what does work? And I started thinking, well, you know, I cured myself. Anybody, you know, I'm a, I'm a highly trained scientist, uh, and I was able to use my scientific training to help myself and to heal myself. But I thought about it, I said, what if, what if somebody else was in the same position I was in what would have happened to them? Well, my death was a medical certainty. You can be certain that other person would have died. So I started thinking, how do I take what I've learned and bring it to others? And I've been doing that now for a few decades. Um, and I've written five books on the subject. Uh, and they're all cutting edge books. And, um, and what I've done is I've simplified things. You see, if we look at human health, it's infinitely complex, infinitely complex. According to the World Health Organization, there's over 12,500 diseases. Well, name somebody who can cope with over 12,000 diseases. <laughs> nobody can do this, nobody. Um, so if you want to help people, if you want ordinary people like yourselves to be able to take charge of their health, and you have something infinitely complex with 
thousands and thousands of diseases, what do you do? The answer is you have to simplify. And so what I've done is I've taken all this complexity and I've cut through the mystery and I've simplified health and disease so that anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. I teach this to 10-year-olds. People all over the world have bought my books with terminal illnesses. I wrote a book on how to cure cancer. People around the world with terminal cancer buy that book, cost $15, they go home, they cure their cancer. Uh, and it's just, it's happened all the time. People keep coming up to me, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was here a couple of years ago, and, uh, and a guy came up to me, and he said, thank you, thank you, thank you, God bless you, God bless you. Uh, he said, I had terminal melanoma. I had 26 rapidly growing tumors all over my body. Um, the doctors at Stanford told me nothing could be done. I bought your book. I'm totally cancer-free. So you see, when you empower people with simplicity, they can handle it and they can do miracles for themselves. I had another lady come up to me and she, she came up to the podium like this and, uh, and she was saying, look, 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 look. And uh, she got up to the podium and she said, look at my hands, look at my hands. Uh, she said, I had rheumatoid arthritis and I was crippled and you cured me. I didn't do anything. She cured herself. All you have to do is learn a very simple system, which I call the Beyond Health Model, uh, which we teach to children. And if you learn this model, the power is so awesome, you can do almost anything. So, and this power is available to you if you're willing to accept the responsibility to learn how to do it. So, what I've done is made a simple system in which there is only one disease. So now, we don't have to worry about thousands of diseases. There's only one disease. Well, if our doctors say that there's thousands, how can I say that there's one? Well, here it is. See, all of us, are made of little microscopic units of life called cells. A cell is a unit of life. Uh, a bacterium is a single cell organism. It's a unit of life. Um, algae is a single cell organism. It's a unit of life. All of us started life as one single cell in our mother. So we started life as a single cell organism. And now we're multi-trillion cell organisms and we think of ourselves as a body. But you know, that's wrong because you really aren't a body. What you really are is a community of trillions of cells acting together to make you who you are. The basic unit, unit of life is the cell, not your body. So it's all about the cells. So what is disease? Well, disease is when a cell is not functioning normally. When a cell is malfunctioning. Now, when you were one single cell in your mother, if that cell was malfunctioning, you were sick. And it's the same thing today. When you have cells that are malfunctioning, you're sick. And the more cells that you have that are malfunctioning, the sicker you are. So disease is a malfunctioning cell. And there's only one disease, a malfunctioning cell. Now, so all the other diseases simply don't exist. Cancer doesn't exist. Arthritis doesn't exist, diabetes doesn't exist, none of them exist. Now, 
it's okay for you to use those words in conversation, for conversational purposes. It's okay to say, little Johnny has a cold, because that conveys to me that little Johnny has the sneezies, and, uh, and then he's going to have a cough, and we know what's going on. It's okay to say, uh, Aunt Susie has diabetes, because now we know that she has a, a, a sugar problem, a blood sugar problem. So uh, it's all right to say that so-and-so has uh, breast cancer, uh, because now we know what they're experiencing. So for conversational purposes, it's all right to use these terms. It is not all right to use them uh, for treatment purposes. Because if you use them for treatment purposes, then you believe that there is such a thing as diabetes, and you're immediately defeated. Who can cure diabetes? No. Uh, who can cure cancer? Right? Who can cure Alzheimer's? You know. Uh, you can't. You can't. They don't know how to do these things. Don't know how to do these things. So you defeat yourself when you talk about uh, who can cure a cold. I mean, you know, you defeat yourself when you start using these words therapeutically. So start thinking completely differently. Um, you know, I used to see people all the time when I lived here in California, um, and I would know what was wrong with someone before they came through the door. Because I know there's only one disease, malfunctioning cells. Now, the doctor doesn't know that. Um, they have to go into the doctor, the doctor has to do all sorts of fancy testing, and then the doctor finally comes back and says, you have diabetes. Well, what good is that? It's a useless piece of information. Uh, he had just, you know, I knew what was wrong with people before they came through the door, because if you're sick, you have malfunctioning cells. So what do you need to do? You need to change those malfunctioning cells back into normal cells. And when you do that, whatever is wrong goes away. Diabetes disappears, the Alzheimer's disappears, the cancer disappears. It's so simple. So all you have to do is restore the cells to normal function, and whatever is wrong goes away. Isn't that nice? Um, so if you start to incorporate this kind of thinking in, into your mind that there is only one disease, then you're on the way to winning. Well. If a cell malfunctions, why is it malfunctioning? Well, there's only two reasons, just two. Either it's not getting everything it needs to function properly, which we call deficiency, or it is getting things that are interfering with its normal machinery, normal communications, uh, screwing up things. We call that toxicity. So there's one disease, malfunctioning cell, there's two causes of disease, deficiency and toxicity. This is the essence of this very simple, simple system. And once you incorporate that into your thinking, the power is awesome. Because otherwise, disease is very mysterious. Very mysterious, very complicated. Nobody can deal with it. Your doctor can't deal with it. Um, so you're lost, you're done. If you're sick, you're done. I mean, nobody can help you. All the doctor does is suppress your symptoms at great expense, great e economic expense, and also great expense to your body. So let's say you have high blood pressure, and the doctor says, well, I'll give you a pill. And so they give you a pill that poisons your kidneys and lowers your blood pressure. Or they give you a pill that poisons your heart, lowers your blood pressure. Poisons your nervous system, lowers your blood pressure. And you say, success, my blood pressure's down. Well, no, you're being poisoned to death. 
And by the time you're on three drugs, there isn't anybody on the planet who knows what's going on in your body. Your body is now in biochemical chaos. So if there's only two causes of disease, deficiency and toxicity, and you're taking poison, you're adding to toxicity, so you're making yourself sicker and sicker and sicker, and by the time you're on three drugs, you're in biological chaos, and health is when your cells are functioning normally, disease is when your cells are in chaos. So modern medicine keeps people sick, makes them sicker, and kills them. The leading cause of death in the United States is medical intervention. Medical intervention kills about a million people a year. What other industry would be allowed to do that? You know, I just flew out here from Florida. What if the airline industry killed over a million people a year? Who would fly? I'd drive out, I wouldn't fly. Um, yet our doctors kill over a million people a year, and people go to their doctor and think nothing of it. Think twice. So that's the situation, and, uh, and people are making wrong decisions. All you have to do is keep your cells functioning normally, and if they're not, restore them to normal function. And there are different approaches to doing this, and I call them the six pathways, the six pathways. Um, the first pathway is the nutrition pathway. You have to deliver to the cell all of the raw materials it needs every day. That's your job. Uh, you are delivering the groceries. You're a grocery delivery person. That's your job. And if you don't do that, you're going to be sick. If you are chronically short even one essential nutrient, you will eventually get sick. So your job is to deliver the groceries. So that's the nutrition pathway. And there are certain foods that you absolutely have to get out of your life because they're so deadly and so dangerous. Um, sugar is number one. Sugar is a deadly metabolic poison, deadly, deadly poison. Get it out of your life, totally and completely out of your life. You know, the biggest problem with sugar is that when you eat it, you do not immediately fall over dead. Because if you did, you wouldn't need it again. <laughs> and because you don't fall over dead, you continue to eat it, and every time you eat it, it does more permanent damage. And by doing this permanent damage, it ages you, makes you older. So every time you eat sugar, you get older. Well, getting old is an enormous mistake. An enormous mistake. And we are accelerating the aging process every time you eat sugar. So get it out of your life. Uh, get the wheat out of your life. Wheat is a deadly poison. Get it out of your life. Get the dairy out of your life. Uh, get the processed oils out of your life processed oils. Go to the supermarket, get down the aisle with the oils, look at all those oils. All of those oils will kill you. So don't buy them. Don't eat them. And then walk down a little bit. There's uh, salad dressings made with those same oils. Those kill you too. Uh, but it's just a side effect, so if you don't mind dying from them, it's okay. Um, so uh, I call them the big four. The big four, uh, sugar, wheat, dairy, uh, processed oils, get them out of your life. That's a big, uh, a big step forward. And then more fresh vegetables, organically grown fresh vegetables. And you are so blessed here in the Bay Area where you have easy access to organically grown fresh vegetables. I live in Florida, which is an, a wasteland. There's, there's no food in Florida at all. Um, and here you are blessed with easy access to good food. So the next is the toxin pathway. There are three things you have to do with the toxin pathway. We're all toxic waste dump sites. Uh, we're over the top, absolutely over the top. Um, and toxins are now a major cause of disease. 
we're measuring people now with certain toxins that are, exceed what we know causes disease in animals. So the average person is a toxic dump site. It is causing disease. You have to stop that. Now, the first thing you have to do is stop putting toxins in. Learn where they are. In my books, I have, I have whole chapters on toxins. Learn where the toxins are. Stop putting them into your body. Uh, you want to reduce your pesticide load? Get rid of the meat and the dairy in your life. You just reduced your pesticide load by 80%. How easy was that? You have to reduce the amount of toxins you're putting in. Number two, you have to support your body's detoxification system. So you need to give raw materials, again, from your diet, from supplements, to support the detoxification pathways so the body is able to get rid of toxins. Vitamin C, very important to the liver detoxification. You need adequate amounts of vitamin C every day. Um, number three, you have to get rid of existing toxins that are already stored in your body, and for that you have to sauna on a regular basis. Saunas are now a household necessity, um, and it is no longer a choice as to whether you want to do them or not. You must do them or you will be sick. So um, we're now over the top and toxic load, hundreds and hundreds of toxins all bioaccumulating in our bodies uh, and getting up to concentrations where they are so screwing up cell function that we're all getting sick from them. The only way we know how to reliably get rid of these oil-soluble toxins is with a sauna. So you need to start saunering on a regular basis and you need to learn how to do it and I explain how to do it in, in my books. Um, so there's your three things with the toxins. Stop putting the toxins in, support, nutritionally support the detoxification pathways, and three, get rid of stored toxins with saunas. Um, the next is the mental pathway, and the mental pathway is more important than any of the others put together because the mental includes the spiritual. Um, and just as everything you put into your body, everything you drink, what you breathe in, what you eat, all these things have an enormous impact on your health, but um, your thoughts also have an enormous impact on your health, and so you not only have to police what goes into your mouth, you have to police what goes into your mind. Um, we know in these well-done studies, good thoughts produce good results and bad thoughts produce bad results. And I once worked with a lady who had had a, a very, bad, very bad divorce 20 years prior, and she now had cancer. And every day for the last 20 years, she relived that divorce. She ran that movie, reran that movie over and over again every day in her mind for the last 20 years. So every time she ran that movie again, she put stress on herself, those same stress chemicals coming out. Now she had cancer. So good thoughts, loving thoughts, caring thoughts uh, have a very beneficial effect on health and uh, Anger and resentment and say, all these other negative thoughts uh, have a very bad impact on health. And your connection to spirit, the ultimate power in the universe, has a very powerful impact on health. Um, so that's the mental pathway. Um, and next is the physical pathway. Um, and one of the most important things in the physical pathway is movement. Um, movement is life. You cannot have life without movement. Um, and if you're not moving, you're dying. So you either have to start moving or you're, you're just going to die. Um, and here's why. See, there are three things you have to do with the cell. Um, one, you have to deliver to the cell all of the things it needs to function properly, and that's the nutrition part. Two, you have to keep the cell free of toxins 
that interfere with its normal function. But three, you have to move and stretch the cell. Because when you move and stretch the cell, you facilitate the delivery of nutrients and you facilitate the removal of toxins. And so we're right back into deficiency and toxicity, and that's why movement is essential. Now, historically, we didn't have to worry about that because historically, we all did something called work. <laughs> there are still a few people who do work. But for the rest of us, we have to do the dreaded E-word. And, um, and that is an evil word. Um, and, uh, and people have all kinds of excuses to avoid that evil. Um, it's raining out. It's, it's too warm out. It's too cold out. I don't want to go out. <laughs> I don't want to get dressed. Um, there are all kinds of reasons why we avoid the dreaded E word. But there's a way to cheat, uh, and that's what's something called a rebounder. And again, I talk about that in my books. Um, even 20 minutes a day on a rebounder, on a good rebounder, um, will give you the movement that you need to keep your cells in good health. So, um, and then the next pathway is the genetic pathway. Uh, and here, there's huge, huge misunderstanding. Um, People think that their genes uh, run everything, their genes run their life, and, and, uh, and you're going to have genes that predispose you to cancer or diabetes or whatever, and you're going to get these things. Um, that's just nonsense because it, that's not the way it works. Um, there are genes, uh, you know, your computer has what we call an operating system. Well, you have an operating system too. Um, runs in the background, keeps everything running. About 30% of your genes are the operating system. The other 70% of the genes just sit there and don't do anything until you ask them to do something. So they're like, you know, you have the operating system on the computer, and then you have all these other programs on the computer. Uh, you have a word processing program. When you click on it, you can do all kinds of word processing but you have to click on it and then tell it what you want it to do. The genes are the same way. You have to click on the gene and tell it what you want it to do. And then it does it. So if you have a cancer gene, one gene that predisposes you to cancer, and you go to the gene and you say, oh, please give me cancer. Um, the gene is an obedient servant and will give you all the cancer you want. And then when you have all the cancer you want, you'll become very, very unhappy. Uh, and if you're really that unhappy, stop asking. The gene is a servant. It does what you ask of it. So how do we ask? Well, the biochemical environment that we create inside the cell is what gives signals to the genes. That and our thoughts and other things give signals to the genes that tell the genes what to do. So we have to be careful about the signals that we give to the genes. So you have to have a good biochemical environment in your cell. And there again, we come into deficiency and toxicity. You have to make sure the cell has what it needs and is not toxic because you know what? The toxins in the cell give funny signals to the genes. So uh, if you have toxins in your cells giving funny signals to the genes, you're out of control. The body's out of control. So um, we have to be careful uh, genetically to be sure that we're giving proper signals to the genes. We have to keep the genes in good repair. Genes get damaged every single day, every moment of every day. They're getting damaged, but you have all these repair mechanisms to keep them in good repair. However, if you are deficient in repair materials or your toxicity is shutting down the repair machinery, those genes are going to stay damaged and when the cell replicates, 
you're going to have damaged genes. And you're going to continue to accumulate more and more and more damage with time. And that's how we age, that's how we go out of control, that's how we get sick. So you have to take care of your genes. Make sure they're getting all the repair materials they need. Make sure that you don't have toxins that are interfering with the repair process. Um, and the, the final pathway is the medical pathway. And uh, in there, you have to be really, really careful um, because uh, the, the medical thing confuses us. You know, we, we see the miracles of medicine, and there are true miracles in medicine. Uh, but the true miracles are pretty much confined to a couple of areas, um, trauma care and crisis intervention, We're at about 15% of medicine. The other 85% of medicine is basically nonsense, and, and it doesn't work. And so you've got to be really, really careful when you, when you interact with the medical profession. Um, our doctors are, now get me wrong, our doctors are amazing people, they're wonderful people, they're caring people. You know, I was in the Army, um, and we had medics in the Army, um, and medics are not MDs, uh, but they're highly trained uh, professionals. And, uh, and these people, you know, if someone was injured, they would be the first to run to them. And the, uh, to their aid, and, and they would risk their lives. They'd risk their life to go help somebody else who's injured. Um, and they'd try to stop the flow of blood, and they'd, they'd, uh, they'd try to comfort them. These are good people. So our medical people, for the most part, not all, but for the most part, are good people. They're caring people. And, and they take risks to help others. The problem with our medical doctors is that these very good people make the biggest mistake of their life, and they go to medical school, <laughs> where they are taught, essentially 85% of what they're taught is unscientific nonsense. And then they're cut loose on the general population to practice unscientific nonsense. Well, it doesn't work. And that's why people stay sick. That's why they get sicker. That's why the costs keep increasing. And that's why quite a medical intervention is the leading cause of death. So be careful, the medical. So those are the six pathways. Um, learn to master the six pathways. There's one disease. There's two causes of disease. There's six pathways to disease. This is a simple system that if you learn to master it, um, you can keep yourself healthy. Now, here at age 48, I almost died. My death was a certainty. I'm now age 80, and I have boundless energy. I never get sick. In the last 32 years, I've had three health problems. I had three colds. In 32 years, I had three colds. And I have a very good excuse for each cold. There's no excuse for having a cold. It's totally irresponsible, and it ages you. You don't want to get old. You don't want to get old. Um, I have the arteries of a 22-year-old. So my probability of having a heart attack or a stroke is that of a 22-year-old, not an 80-year-old. I'm cancer-proof. So you can make yourself disease-proof. You need to reduce your biological age. You see, we have no control over our chronological age. Every year on our birthday, we get a year older. But we do have control over our biological age. And it is extremely important that you keep your biological age substantially younger than your chronological age. We're not doing this. A few years ago, we did a, a study of 10-year-olds. The average age, biologically, was 45. So when you're measuring 10-year-olds who are 45 years old, what are these kids going to be when they're 50? You know, maybe dead. This is the first generation of American children that will not live longer than their parents because they are so 
old and so sick. I've got a friend, a doctor who works with uh, aging. Uh, he measures 30-year-olds who are 80 years old. We got it turned around. You want to measure an 80-year-old who's biologically 30, not a 30-year-old who's biologically 80. So we're out of control here, and uh, we've lost control of the repair process. You see, the body is a self-repairing system, unlike your car. Your car just wears out, and you have to keep replacing parts. You don't wear out. You're a self-repairing system. So all the wear and tear you put on you every day, you go to bed at night, gets repaired. You're as good as new in the morning, only we're not because we aren't giving ourselves the repair materials, and we're poisoning the repair machinery, and so because we don't have the repair materials and the machinery isn't working right, you wake up in the morning with a repair deficit. You haven't repaired all the wear and tear from that day. And then tomorrow, another repair deficit, and the next day, another repair deficit, and pretty soon, you need a hip replacement or a knee replacement or you know, pretty soon you're falling apart for lack of repair and you're getting older and older and older and older instead of younger. You have to go back into the repair mode and start becoming younger. Um, if you do it right, Almost anybody can be 10 years younger in one year. Uh, the best I've ever done, I, I had one man who became 20 years younger in one year. So you've got to start working at it. You've got to start somewhere. You've got to start becoming biologically younger and keep your biological age under your chronological age. And that's how we live longer, live happier, uh, don't lose function as we age, uh, and we don't run up the bills. So problem solved, and all you have to do is take personal responsibility and learn how to take care of yourselves. And when you do this, we all win. You win, your family wins, America wins, um, and it's not that difficult to do. And my books are going to be available for $15, uh, I'll take any questions. Do I have time for questions? Where, how am I doing on time? That clock is wrong. That clock is wrong? Oh, okay. Well, it didn't fall back. Test, 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 test. I think we have a question here. Oh, you got a question? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I'd like your opinion on coconut oil and butter, especially grass-fed, no hormone, no antibiotic, cow butter. Uh -huh. okay. I, I hear a lot of uh, negatives about oil. You, you said don't touch oil, but I'm just wondering what you think about coconut oil. Um, good coconut oil, and again, uh, not easy to find. Um, I make my own, by the way, and it's available on my website. Um, good coconut oil um, is a very healthy food. And, uh, and good butter is a very healthy food. Both are difficult to find, but they're healthy foods. Uh, of course, like anything, don't do them to excess, but uh, they're healthy foods. How do you measure biological age? How do you measure biological age? Well, there are different approaches. Um, uh, for one thing, there is, uh, as you may know, the little ends of your chromosomes called telomeres. Have I heard of telomeres? <clears throat> well, the length of your telomeres is an indicator of your age. And as you age, the telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, and finally, they get so short, um, everything unravels and you die. So the length of your telomeres is one indicator of age. Um, there are hormone measurements that indicate age. There are other um, 
biological chemicals that enter age. Um, uh, we measure my arteries uh, by using something called a Doppler ultrasound test. Um, and, uh, and that listens, basically what it does is it listens for noise in your arteries. The more clogged your arteries are, the more noisy they become. Um, and also measures the elasticity of your arteries. If you're young, your arteries are elastic. If you're old, your arteries are hardened. Um, so by listening for the noise and measuring the elasticity, um, you can come out with a calculation as to the age of the arteries. And so there are different approaches to measuring biological age. Um, and, uh, but it, 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 people are doing a lot of this now regularly to measure biological age. Can you talk a little bit about stress? If I have a job, I lose my job, um, I, I become very stressful, I cannot find a job, this will affect my health. So can you talk a little bit about how to deal with stress? How to deal with stress. Uh, well, you're absolutely correct. Stress is we live in a stressful society. Um, they've measured in Los Angeles, people driving on the freeway in rush hour, they have just as much stress on them as astronauts blasting off for the moon. That's a lot of stress. So we live in a stressful society, um, and stress is a killer. Uh, and how does stress kill? Well, there's only two causes of disease, deficiency and toxicity. So when you put stress on yourself, it produces stress hormones and stress chemicals in the body. Um, and the production of these stress chemicals uses up precious nutrients and causes deficiency. And then when these stress chemicals build up to high levels, they themselves have a toxic effect on the body. So stress kills through deficiency and toxicity. Um, the best way I know, well, first of all, the dreaded E word, um, exercise, is a good way to get stress levels down. Um, but meditation is really super, super. Um, uh, so if you don't know how to meditate, go to classes, learn how to meditate, meditate for at least 20 minutes a day. And what that does is it gets your stress levels down. So even though you're putting more stress on. Now, in the old days, um, I had a very stressful job. I, you know, I was, um, um, uh, there was years when I was a, a, a turnaround, corporate turnaround expert. And you go into a corporation that is dying, and you have to turn that corporation around and make it healthy again. Uh, and you have to fire people, and you have to hire people, and you've got, I mean, uh, and, and your reputation depends on whether or not you are successful. And if you're not successful, you may not get another job. Um, very, very, very stressful. Um, and I got to tell you, there were weeks that at the end of the week, I was just wired. Um, I had a, a, a place on a mountain up in New Hampshire, and I'd drive up to New Hampshire on a Friday night, and it wouldn't be till Monday morning when I was, my stress levels were back down again. And then by the end of the week, I'd be wired again, absolutely wired. Um, it, it's a killer. So, but if you meditate, say even 20 minutes a day, if you meditate, um, what you do is you pull that level down. You see, every, every day my level, my stress levels are getting higher and higher and the stress chemicals were getting higher and higher. But if you bring that down every day, then it never gets up to this excessive level to where you're really wired. Um, so meditation and exercise are two really fabulous ways to deal with that. More uh, questions? So um, my grandson fell off his bike and he got cut here from the handlebar that didn't have a thing on it. This was just two days ago. And so he got stitches and they gave him an antibiotic cream, okay? Now, I had a cut that was probably two or three times 
longer and, and it was deeper and I used turmeric jammed in there and I have no scar. You can barely see anything. Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> I have two questions. Number one, uh, will that antibiotic cream affect his microbiome, his gut bacteria, since it's topical? And number two, you know, this, this is total hypothetical, but do you think that, I mean, it was by his mouth, so it seems, and he's only four and a half, so it seems like it would have been difficult to keep the turmeric in there, and it's, you know, he already has the stitches now, but anyway, what do you have to say? <laughs> well, um, it is possible that that would affect his microbiome, but um, uh, hardly anybody in America gets that old uh, before they've had an antibiotic orally. Uh, never had any. Never had any. Never. Well, God bless. Uh, never, ever, ever allow him to have any. Um, he's probably okay. I mean, I don't know, but he's probably okay uh, from affecting the microbiome uh, because I don't think that the exposure was um, sufficient enough to have a major effect on, on the microbiome. So uh, that's just a guess, uh, but uh, he's probably okay. And, uh, and God bless his parents and you uh, for keeping him healthy and away. Antibiotics are one of the biggest blunders in the history of the world. They rank up with vaccinations as uh, two of the biggest blunders in the history of the world. So do you think, I mean, hold on. So, so, um, I'm thinking now, so this is day two or three, and I'm thinking, because I was thinking, well, wait till the stitches, they said five days till the stitches dissolve, and I was thinking, wait till it's closed, but I didn't wait till it was closed on my leg, so maybe start putting turmeric there. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay, yeah. thank you. More questions? Uh, my my question is, uh, what's your take on a ketone diet? On the which diet? Ketone. Ketone. Ketogenic. Ketone, ketogenic. 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 Um, you eat more fat and then uh, like a seventy percent fat and then uh, twenty percent carb and ten percent protein. I I don't have any problem with it. I think it's perfectly okay, um, but you know there are so many diets. Um, People all over the world have thrived on many diets. Um, Eskimos eat a different diet than South Sea Islanders, and South Sea Islanders eat a different diet than Australian bush people, and Australian bush people eat a different diet than desert nomads. And uh, so humans have thrived on uh, quite a varied diet. Um, so it's hard to say what's best. Uh, but if we look at all of these diets and try to find, well, what's a common denominator? Well, the common denominator is they're all eating real food. <laughs> they're all eating food that nature produces, and they're eating it fresh, and they're not eating any sugar. There's the absence of sugar and the absence of processed foods. So the most important thing to do is not eat processed foods, not eat sugar, not eat the big four, uh, and then, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, it's hard to say what's the best diet for a human being, uh, and we're all different, uh, and we've thrived on different diets. So uh, if somebody wants to go on that particular diet, well, God bless, no, it's okay. Uh, but stay away from the big four, stay away from the bad stuff. Get the sugar out of your life. <laughs> That's a, I can't repeat that often enough. It's a, such a deadly poison. Yeah, I was listening to uh, Dr. Joel Wallach, the dead doctors don't lie doctor, not too long ago, and he was telling a story about how Jerry Lewis brought the Muscular Dystrophy Association, the cure for muscular dystrophy, and they fired him. 
No. <laughs> and they didn't and they didn't put it out. They don't want any cures. They just want the research money coming. That, that's in. correct. There's no reason for any of these people, um, the Heart Association, the Cancer Association, the Diabetes Association, the, there's no reason for any of these people to want a cure because if there's a cure, they're out of business. Um, uh, I do not give a dime to cancer research uh, because it's all wasted. Um, Linus Pauling once said, most cancer research is a fraud, um, and it's a jobs program uh, to keep people employed, and they just go round and round and round in circles, and they keep announcing great breakthroughs and great discoveries, and, uh, and which never pan out, but they keep announcing new ones to keep you going. Um, they're really not doing anything that, um, that will solve the problems, and, uh, and they don't want to, uh, because uh, you, all these people will be unemployed. And the bottom line is, we already know how to cure cancer, so you don't need to spend another dime on research, because we already know how to do it. So, I'd like to uh, dig into that sugar comment a little bit. At the cellular level in the mitochondria, in the uh, metabolic cycle, uh, a glucose atom is split in the first step. So it has to have glucose, to, and it generates ATP and with maybe 10 or 12 other steps. ATP is the, uh, the energy molecule that runs everything. Right. And it runs on both sugar and fructose both. That, that's part of the cycle, if you take a look at the biochemical pathways. So I don't... Sugar, staying away from sugar, if somebody literally said that, they never eat any, any fruit, they'd have to stay away from a lot of vegetables because well, there's no, no, sugar in the vegetables. Sugar, the so you, can you please be okay, more careful to define what you mean yeah. by sugar? Yeah, well, the commercial definition of sugar is refined sugar. Now, chemically, um, sugar is a type of sugars, the whole family of sugars are a type of molecule. But in, in commerce, sugar is refined sugar. Um, and that's what I'm talking about, is refined sugar. I'm not talking about the sugar in an apple or a banana. Um, uh, that's OK, because the sugar in the fruit is combined with the fiber um, and is not very bioavailable. So the sugar will come out and become bioavailable over a period of time, it doesn't immediately become bioavailable like refined sugar, and you get the big insulin spike. Now, that's why you can't drink fruit juices, because if you make fruit juice, you make the sugar immediately bioavailable. So drinking orange juice is a really bad idea. Fruit juice is a really bad idea. Now, eating fruit is OK. But uh, yeah, fruit juice is not, because you've made the sugar too bioavailable. Um, and the problem with refined sugar is that it is immediately bioavailable. And, uh, and then you get the insulin spike. Um, there was one researcher once who was asked, um, is there a single key to disease? And the researcher thought for a moment, and he said, well, I don't know. But if there is a single key to disease, it's insulin. Because when you make your insulin go up, and here again, this is why sugar is such a deadly poison and why it ages you. When you make your insulin go up, this triggers an enormous amount of biochemistry. Uh, all of it's detrimental. Uh, and so insulin is a killer. You need to keep your insulin under control and you do that by not eating refined sugars or highly bioavailable sugar. Um, and that means you shouldn't be eating white potatoes and, 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 uh, and grains. Grains uh, are like eating sugar because uh, grains are made of starches. Well, starches are sugar molecules that are stuck together. And in the digestive system, the, the digestion system unsticks them. So all those sugar molecules become immediately bioavailable. Uh, so grains are bad for you. 
Um, humans were never designed or intended to eat grains. Um, and when we started eating grains, health just went to heck in a handbasket. Um, and it's still going down. So, however, half of all the food in the world today is grains. So, <laughs> if we all stopped eating grains, everybody starved to death. But I don't eat grains. I'm very, very, very little. I have some, but very little in my diet. I basically do not eat grains. I eat no bread whatsoever. Uh, bread is made of wheat, and of course, wheat is a deadly poison, so you don't want to do that. More questions? Okay, I didn't know who raised their hand first. But... Um, you made some comment early on about um, medicine, maybe medicine, the practice of medicine changing. I, I don't remember exactly what you said, but um, I'm hearing that a lot of doctors are bailing on the current medical system and becoming like functional doctors or integrative doctors. Mm -hmm. And I heard an interview with Dr. Mark Hyman once say he thinks within 15 years the practice of medicine will be so transformed that we won't even recognize it. I think that would be a good thing, but do you have any sense of is there that much change going on in the medical there, system? Well, I think Mark is uh, being a little optimistic on that. Um, he's very gung-ho on the subject. Uh, I think he's being a little optimistic on how fast the change will happen. Uh, but basically, um, what we call allopathic medicine is about 100 years old. Um, Ayurvedic medicine is about 6,000 years old. Chinese medicine is about 5,000 years old. Um, allopathic medicine is 100 years old. It's already on the way out because it's basically stupid. And it doesn't work. And it's very dangerous. Um, and a few years ago, the um, National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine at the National Academy of Sciences, which is pretty prestigious, issued a report and said that um, the medicine we have uh, is now so far behind the science that it is impossible to bring it up to date. And it said that we have to take the medicine we have and discard it and start over. Um, and my books start over. This is a whole new system of medicine with one disease and two causes of disease. Um, so we need to start over, but in the meantime, you have to understand that the medicine being practiced by most physicians um, is a pretty stupid form of medicine, uh, and it's on the way out, so be really, really, really careful. Um, don't allow yourself to be damaged by it. Um, where did we ever get the idea that we can help a sick person if we give them poison? Yeah. And a prescription drug is a toxic chemical, in other words, it's a poison, that is specifically designed to poison some aspect of your body chemistry in order to suppress a symptom. And you do suppress the symptom. Well, you lower your cholesterol. Wonderful, right? Yeah, but your liver is being poisoned, and, uh, and you're going to get cancer, and you're going to get diabetes, and you're going to uh, destroy your brain, and you're going to destroy your muscles, and you're going to lower your immunity. But those are just side effects. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a pretty stupid system. Uh, but it makes enormous amounts of money and the drug companies have enormous power because they have so much money. And I think Mark um, is being a little bit optimistic about the 15 years because there are billions and billions of dollars betting against him. Yeah. You, you said something about vaccination earlier. Yes. And I was asked a couple of times by two different doctors in the last couple of weeks, did you have the flu shot yet? And I said, no, I don't believe in flu shots. So is that uh, the right attitude that I have? Uh, yes, God bless you. Uh, <laughs> flu shots don't work. Yeah. In fact, there, there are some studies that show if you have a flu shot, your risk of getting the flu actually increases. 
Um, and, uh, and every flu shot will do permanent damage to your body. So you're permanently damaging your body, permanently damaging your immunity, permanently damaging your nervous system um, in exchange for little or no protection whatsoever from the flu, and maybe even increasing your risk of getting the flu. Uh, so is that a good deal? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. So you're pretty smart. Your, your common sense is working for you. Uh, keep it up. Yeah, question about bread. You, you said you don't, have, you don't eat bread. Right. But is there any safe, healthy bread on the market? Like I see uh, Dr. Uh, Dave's Killer Bread, for example. It's all organic uh, grains and well, you know, um, nothing it, bad in it, supposedly. Um, yeah, nothing bad in it, supposedly. But when you, when you go back to basics, uh, that human beings are not designed to eat grains and should not eat grains, well, that answers the question. Um, yeah, we're not, the body's not designed to eat grains. I have a question. Uh, since you mentioned vaccine, I'm just wondering about the attitudes of the people here. How many people here did not have a flu shot? <laughs> okay, let's do it the other way. How many well, people here did well, have a flu shot? How many people did have it? So remember, if you're a healthcare worker in Santa Clara County, you must have been or you can't work. Everywhere. Right, well... Getting to the healthcare economics level, right? I, I, I understand. Uh, you need to find a friendly doctor who'll sign off on it. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing. I go around the country. Um, I was in, where was I? I, I was in Minneapolis, St. Paul, lecturing and we talked about vaccinations, and, and afterwards, this group of women came up to me, uh, and they said, thank you for saying the things that you said. Um, we don't vaccinate our children. Um, we have a doctor who signs off and says that they're vaccinated, uh, but we don't vaccinate the kids. And guess what? When a flu epidemic goes through the school, our kids are the only ones who don't get the flu. And uh, so, uh, you know, there are various ways of approaching it, it's, uh, but it, uh, it's, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy that uh, uh, they are forcing you to do harm to yourself in order to keep your job. I think it's unconstitutional. So. Any more questions? Is the main problem with dairy, the hormones given to the cows, is, is there, you know, is dairy okay if they're, you know, grass-fed or buffalo meat? <laughs> okay, is the main problem with dairy the hormones given to the cows? No, the main problem with dairy is the dairy. Um, you have to understand what milk is. Milk is Mother Nature's perfect food, but it is the perfect food or the infant of a specific species. Each milk is biochemically unique for that species, for the need of the infant of that species. So you, there are two things you can't do. You can't cross species feed because you're not addressing the needs. And you can't feed milk after weaning. So you can't feed milk to the adult of the species because the milk is very specific to the needs of the infant of the species and you'll make the adult sick. So um, nowhere in nature does one species drink the milk of another species, except for the crazy humans who do that. Uh, and nowhere in nature does the adult of the species drink milk, except for the crazy humans. Uh, and there are good biological reasons for that. Um, uh, but when you come to cow milk, um, you see the cow milk is loaded with growth hormones and that's a real problem all by itself. Uh, because, um, you know, it's one thing if you have a, um, a kitten uh, drinking the mother's milk 
the kitten's going to grow to a cat, but you know, it's not that much bigger than the kitten. But you've got a 50 pound calf that's going to become a, a 1500 pound cow. Um, you need a load of growth hormone to make that calf grow up into the big cow. So cow milk is loaded with growth hormone. Um, that's okay to make the calf grow, but if you give growth hormone to an adult uh, and you keep signaling the body to grow, 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 well, guess what? You'll grow, but then we call it a tumor. But that's only a side effect, so it's nothing to worry about if you don't mind having tumors. Um, and uh, ice cream, uh, from my observations, ice cream is probably the single largest cause of prostate cancer, for example, uh, because of the enormous amount of growth hormone in it. So um, you stay away from dairy. I mean, it is, uh, now, there are safe ways, for example, um, you know, yogurt, real yogurt, uh, is a healthy food because the, the bugs have transformed the, uh, the molecules and done a lot of chemistry. Um, so yogurt made from like um, goat milk or sheep milk or something like that, um, not cow milk, um, is a decent food. Uh, the problem is trying to find it, and, and you can't find it. Um, it. It has to come from healthy animals and... Uh, uh, and uh, with good bugs and hard to find. So um, uh, the Queen Elizabeth uh, uh, eats yogurt, uh, but she imports hers from Romania, flies it in from Romania, because there's no yogurt in the United Kingdom. So um, you might give her a call, see if you could get some of her stash. And, uh, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, somebody was asking about bread earlier, so I want to mention there's something you can buy that's made from quinoa. Quinoa bread, that's not grain. Uh, quinoa is not a grain, you're absolutely yeah. correct. Um, and they have and, that at the health food store. And, uh, and has been traditionally a, a healthy food. The ancient Incas um, yes. uh, lived quite well on quinoa. And uh, so, um, yeah, that's an option. An option. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I buy it at Country Sun, if you know where that is, on California Avenue. And um, since I'm uh, gluten sensitive, I found out one time I had a blood test and that I was gluten sensitive. So um, that's why I'm eating the quinoa, but it's very good. Good. Who had the, there we go. Um, if species don't cross over with milk and yogurt made from cow milk is not good, why is sheep and goat milk okay for yogurt? Uh, because the chemistry is very different. Um, for example, um, the chemistry of cow's milk, the proteins in cow's milk are radically different from human milk. Radically different from human milk. So a human being has a very difficult time processing cow milk. Goat milk is, the chemistry of goat milk is much closer to the chemistry of human milk and it's much easier for the body to process. Thank you. So, um, she was asked about the yogurt thing. Well, it's the same thing. It, it, the yogurt is, uh, if you make it from the goat milk, um, it, it, you can't make it from the cow's milk. What about amaranth and teff? Well, amaranth and teff are, are healthier grains um, than wheat and, and, uh, and certainly the gluten grains like, like rye and barley. Um, however, they're still grains, and humans were never designed to eat grains. So, uh, however, you know, again, half of all the food in the world is grains, so if you want to have a little bit of teff and a little bit of amaranth in your diet, and, and uh, go ahead. What about ghee, G-H-E-E? -E? Ghee? Ghee. 
G H G H E E. Yes, if it, if it's organic uh, and comes from a good source, uh, sure, it's a it's a um, it, ghee is perfectly acceptable in the diet, and of course, as you know, it has a wonderful buttery flavor. Uh, so, if you want to add a buttery flavor to something, a ghee is very acceptable. Okay. What about cheese? Cheese. Uh, well, again, um, do I have cheese? Um, if I have a, a, a reception at my home, you know, people like cheese and crackers. They, they love their cheese and crackers. Uh, I'll buy some organic goat cheese and, and serve that to guests. Um, and I'll even eat some of it, a little bit of it. Um, so, but again, if it's made from cow's milk, absolutely no. Uh, if it's made from like sheep milk or, or, or goat milk or buffalo milk or something, um, uh, you, can, you can have some in moderation, it's okay. You know, it, it, the, the whole thing is, um, when you follow what I teach, um, none of us can be perfect. Our world is too screwed up. <laughs> None of us can be perfect, and you don't have to be perfect. You don't have, you don't have to be a fanatic. You don't have to go crazy. Um, here's the bottom line. Most of us do most things wrong most of the time, and it's killing us. Turn it around, do most things right most of the time, and it will be like a miracle. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be a fanatic. Just do most things right. Simple. What about kefir? Kefir. Uh, again, if it depends on the source. Um, kefir is okay because, the, again, the bacteria uh, alter the, the composition of the molecules. Um, and so if it comes from a good source. But again, not from cows. Not from cows. Hi, you mentioned uh, earlier your, on your conversation about starches and the kind of how they're not good for you. What is your opinion about prebiotics and um, cold starches, like cold rice, for example, as a prebiotic and the beneficial qualities of that? Well, um, uh, you know, people are, are, are packaging and selling prebiotics now. Um, we all eat prebiotics, uh, we call it food. Um, and now people are taking specific molecules out of the food and putting it in bottles and selling it as prebiotics. Um, uh, some of them work. Uh, uh, I, I'm not against them. I think it's perfectly okay. But some of them you have to be careful of to use only for a short term um, and not for a long term because um, if you use them long term, uh, you can actually... Uh, cause the overgrowth of things you don't want to overgrow. Uh, so, um, uh, but prebiotics can be very helpful in, in certain cases, so. Okay, we've got to wrap it up um, for Raymond here, so let's give him a round of applause.